Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 42, Fortran. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everyone. So we got some interesting listener feedback. Uh, we got a lot of interesting listener feedback. Um, one of them in particular. Listener feedback is interesting. That's true. Just yeah, put it actually, out there. We got we, we got love you some guys. feedback of which all was interesting. And uh, one reason. in particular <laughs> was uh, strong versus weak typing. So somebody corrected me and said that... Uh, Python, JavaScript are strongly typed languages. And I remember like kind of having this debate with somebody at the time, but it didn't really get, we didn't have smartphones and so it didn't get resolved. Um, so I went and looked into this and it's actually really interesting. This one's like as, as, as engineers and scientists, like our field is kind of very sort of pedantic and deterministic and sort of explained very well. That's kind of part of our nature. Um, but this is one of those things that's completely up to interpretation. So, so wait, wait, are not, you saying you're wrong or not? Because I don't want to have to print another retraction. <laughs> so actually, nobody's right. So oh, this is the so we're there's just a kind of right. I know there's a gradient. On one side of the gradient is the most weakly typed languages, like um, like Ruby or R, or you know, like languages like that where. There's no type system and there's no type errors. So for example, like in R, you can do like Patrick plus one. And I think in R it typecasts to spring, uh, to string. So if you do like Patrick plus one, you'll get Patrick one. Um, and so that is like, and also R doesn't have any, you know, any type safety or type checking or, you know, types. Uh, uh, you know, as you're programming or anything like that. So R is considered like very weakly typed, right? And it supports bare words, um, things like that. Um, you can make Ruby similar, like you can make some changes to Ruby and Ruby will support bare words. And uh, bare words just means that you can say like, like Jason, go to the mall and it will just like interpret that as a string. It's kind of weird. So like at some point, like your code can be a string and it, it's kind of goofy. Anyways. So that's like very weakly typed. So then strongly typed is say like Java where, you know, everything has a type. The type is defined, um, you know, explicitly and at compile time, you know, by you. And you have to adhere to that type. You can't say, you know, person A equals like new restaurant or something, you know, like except for some extenuating circumstances um <laughs> yeah you think about that talk too except for some extraneous circumstances you uh um you, know, you can't do that it won't let you right so those are the two ends of the spectrum right so wait now, you put java on the other end that's what you said yeah i would have gone with like I, haskell or something haskell, where like the type type is actually used to great strength but okay it's okay go ahead that's fair i guess uh like something with a more uh, in your face type system yeah, yeah. I mean, the type... So, Haskell definitely makes better use of the type system, but I, w I don't know if it's stricter or not. Okay, I don't know yeah. the exact I don't axis know. this is being drawn on. It's so. probably the same level as... Anyways, so... So, Java's very strict. Like, you can think of C++ as being kind of in the middle somewhere because, you know, it can be as strict as Java, but you can also just cast anything to void. You could... I guess in Java, you could have everything as an object. Um... It's like all of your classes just had objects and then and then it would kind of so one part of this is it really doesn't depend too much on the language, but how the language is most often used because you can make Java more weakly typed if you wanted to, but nobody actually programs that way. Um, so the other part of this is I sort of always said it's weakly typed if there weren't any types known at compile time. So in other words, like Python, you could say x equals three, then the very next line could say x equals Patrick, and that's fine. Like x can be whatever you want it to be. Um, and so because of that, I would say Python, JavaScript, these languages are weakly typed. Um, but these languages are more strongly typed than say R, 
right? Because in Python, you can't say Patrick plus one. You get a type error. Um, so it really just depends on sort of where you draw the line in the sand. Like there's this gradient, and if you draw the line at, you know, uh, being able to support bare words and uh, automatically type casting everything so that there's no errors, <laughs> then you're going to look at everything else as strongly typed. And so we drew our line where we drew it. Um, but even like professors, things like that, there's no, no one has gone out and said, okay, here's, here's, here's what it is. And so it's totally up to interpretation. That was a weak, the typed argument. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, while Jason was, uh, trying to assuage Ranting. his problem of uh, feeling like he got it wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm just happy it wasn't me who got it wrong. <laughs> I, no, please, no one uh, write in and tell me the things I got wrong. I know, it's everything. Um, so I posted <laughs> a link here, and you can just search uh, W-A-T, WAT, uh, programming talk is what I searched to find it. Uh, and there's a, a lecture someone gave or a presentation at a conference where they go through various languages. And I think this made the round several times through the internet. So you've probably already yeah, seen it. This is but, so um, good. This is a couple years old where uh, the guy is, you know, giving kind of a slick prepared presentation about various languages and kind of using and abusing them. And he talks about bare words in there, like um, getting JavaScript to give you the Batman theme song by... <laughs> right. Causing things to be not a number when they sh don't seem like they should return not a number. Yep. Um, anyways, I, I guess JavaScript doesn't have bare words. I guess bare words is in Ruby. That's right. Yeah. So. And even then, you have to do something special to, you know, enable that that bug. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Oh, maybe. Yeah. That, wait, you mean that internet talk I watched wasn't completely upfront? Well, actually, they are. If if you see like the part where he's like, you can do this, and the Ruby supports bare words, he actually like hacks together some function, which uh, like does some ridiculousness. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I've always felt like if 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 a language is weakly typed, like Python or JavaScript, then it's um, it's only good for kind of like so. There's a bunch of different. You should definitions. say weaker typed. Yeah, it's true. Weaker typed. So, <laughs> I. My 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 like litmus test is this: if the if the program is meant to run for an hour or longer, then you use a strongly typed language. Other people have said things like, "Oh, if it has more than a hundred lines of code, you know, don't use Python." And so there's just various different metrics, but at a high level, like the weaker the typing is, um, the better you have to check. You know, either if it's weakly typed, either your program needs to run fast, in which case, you know, if the program takes a second to run, then it really doesn't matter whether you get a compiler error or a runtime error, right? Um, or you have to do a very good job checking all of the code paths. So if it's if it's intended, the program's intended to run for like days and days, then hopefully like there isn't some syntax error or some just goofy type error, you know, in some if statement that only runs once a day. Yes, right? that is something that annoys me about Python. I had written a tool that had worked flawlessly. My team was using it, no complaints. And it turned out there was this bug where if you, uh, it was properly looking for the error to occur. It was reading um, data in. And if it saw like a improperly formatted something, it was supposed to print out like what, why it was improperly formatted except mm -hmm. that the thing I was printing out was of a different type than I expected it. Like think, uh, I was tr I was assuming it would be a list and instead it was just, uh, or an array, and instead it was just a string. So I was trying to, you know, kind of undo oh, the wrapping of the list to print it cleanly. And no one hit this bug for, you know, however long. And then finally, like, we had some uh, bad data come across and, it, you know, it, it crashed Python instead of giving the nice printout of like, hey, I saw you did something wrong and I'm going to close gracefully. It just, you know, uh, stack unwound. Oh, really? You didn't get just like a Python error? You got oh, yeah, no, no, but error? a Python error, but like the whole, you oh, know, okay, like okay. Here, trace right. back, the trace back for Python. Um, right, but that, right. that had been there for who knows how long. Um, yep. And, and uh, a I, compiler, I guess, you know, in theory, if they were stronger typed than it is, I would have been able to detect that the thing I was passing around wasn't of the type it once had been and that I had since changed. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have a bunch of JavaScript code. I have that title wave, you know, the company wiki is on that. And I have the, um, I actually wrote a meme gen, meme generator 
So at work, we can just make like funny jokes and send them to each other. And I'm thinking, wow, about, you really want to get fired. <laughs> I know. I'm actually thinking about uh, like so. There's this language called TypeScript. We talked about TypeScript before. But the cool thing about TypeScript is you can just start with JavaScript and then slowly add type annotations, and then eventually, like everything is statically typed. And if 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 you don't have a type, TypeScript will kind of like complain, but not too loudly. So you can sort of migrate slowly. And I want to do that um, because for this, this is like you what you talked about. Like occasionally, someone crashes the wiki for for the whole company, and it's because it's like some area of the code that I hadn't really tested well or. Just some some goof that would have been caught with type safety. So it's not strong or weak typed; it's stronger or weaker typed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Before you say something is strongly typed, you have to put your reference point. So, what would be the <laughs> most strongly typed? Would be like if you only allowed one type. Um, like a whole program, like that one where it's all uh, it's all music or something. There's only one operation, right? Oh, what was that called? It's like the computer built only out of NOR gates. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Anyways, yeah, I forgot doesn't what matter. But I don't know if like having just one type makes the... Um, I mean, I guess a language that had no polymorphism, right, would be more strongly typed because you couldn't really do anything goofy. Um, like Java has, you know, object, but, but nobody actually uses it unless like it's very specific circumstances. So... Uh, so I would say Java is like. I'm guessing very if you had only type. one integral type, like only unsigned 32-bit integers. You're talking about like Fortran, <laughs> like the early version of Fortran. So yeah. Shh, shh. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> that's called uh, that's called Jason not not picking up on the <laughs> spoiler alert. Oh my god. That's All right. Funny. To the Whoosh. news. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, so uh, first news article is this pretty cool thing. It's called Disk. So um, so there's Redis, and Redis is pretty cool. So actually, let's step back even further. There's Memcached. Memcached was written by the, um, I guess, CEO or like head engineer of LiveJournal, which was like a social network that was popular, you know, like, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and what memcache does is just simple like key value lookup. And if you have like keys that are accessed very frequently, memcache does exactly what it says. It caches them in memory and then doesn't have to go to disk. Um, and if you have some key value pairs that are not used very frequently, then in memcache falls through and then you would then go to your database or what have you. And so the idea is you know, your logo, your company logo, which everyone sees every time they load a page, is accessed very frequently. So um, Memcached would just like for free, in a sense, take things like your company logo and and um, cache them in RAM. So you wouldn't have, it optimizes your, uh, reduces your database overhead. So Redis is basically Memcached plus one. So it's just the interface is much easier. It's much cleaner. There's, um, it can do like some cool persistence. So, you know, if your machine dies, it can store to disk. So when the machine comes back up, it doesn't have to like rebuild the cache on the fly. Um, has a bunch of cool things like that. And it's just much more modern. Um, so now if you look at the um, message queue space, this is where you have different machines and they want to pass messages to each other. Um, you know, the same kind of thing where there's RabbitMQ, there's Kafka, there's Camel, there's like a bunch of these, but all of them are kind of old and antiquated or they're slow. Um, so finally someone kind of went through and built Disk, which is a completely in-memory message passing um, subsystem. It looks pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna definitely look into it. And so I can tell you guys more in the future after I've done some study on it, but um, it looks like it looks like it'd be pretty useful. I mean, a lot of people right now use Redis for message passing, but it's not really designed for that. So they're kind of you have to do like a lot of trickery to make it work. Well, message and passing is yeah, needs a lot of easy. tuning, like the, all the different options, like mm -hmm. messages being redeliverable if the host, the you know, recipient dies, or that kind of 
configurability. But this one has a giant warning that it's still alpha state and don't use it in production. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so um, I never know when yeah. stuff says that if it really means it because a lot of software says that and it is like everyone uses like everyone uses the alpha version of the next release because it's so much better and it's been out for a year versus yep. like oh no literally I wrote this last weekend and it's probably awful don't try it yeah that's the thing like you know obviously you're fixing bugs as you get them and so like as time goes forward you've you know like in version two, you have more bugs fixed than version one. That is a guarantee because the number of bugs fixed is just monotonically increasing, right? Or at least mon is not decreasing. Um, but as you said, like, you know, the alpha version has a whole bunch of new features and presumably adds new bugs. And so it's just... So the number guess, of bugs might be higher, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think like what you said, you kind of have to just read the documentation and just try and read between the lines and figure out if the person really means like this is alpha because I hacked it together at TechCrunch Disrupt and uh, I was, you know, drunk at the time. Or this is alpha because, you know, I haven't formally proven all of the lines of code yet. <laughs> like, those or are what happens more is alphas. like this is a breaking change and I just don't want to deal with the community at this time. So I want to just keep hacking away and do it all at once and rip the Band-Aid off, which is what happens to a lot of projects. Yeah. When yeah, I push this out, a lot uh, of people are going to be mad. So I want to make sure I really know what will change and then I'll push it out. Yeah. That's what happened with Spark. Like for a long time, Spark was just kind of very unstable. And then at one point, at some point they said, okay, like let's just kind of, you know, refactor the whole thing and make it nice and clean. So, uh, recently Amazon's quarterly earning report came out and our obligation to give you news not related to programming, uh, their <laughs> stock jumped through the roof. Um, one of the main reasons other than people just saying the stock went up because the stock went up, um, trying to pin it on some reason because stock movements always have to have a reason, uh, was that new, the Amazon for the first time reported their uh, revenue from their web services. So Amazon Cloud, AWS, Amazon Web Services, I guess, AWS. Yep. Um, they, uh, you know, are selling servers, renting servers to other people to be able to run on. And, and you know, it's become really popular. Everyone probably has heard about it. Um, but before, it had always been kind of just under other parts of the business. But this quarter, they finally broke it out. And they had a revenue of $1.57 billion, uh, which is a lot. But in true Amazon fashion, they managed to take a lot of dollars and profit much less dollars, $265 million. So $265 million <laughs> right. is still a lot of money. Um, but $1.57 billion is a really lot of money. Like Amazon, this is the thing I don't understand about Amazon. They're known for like really good sort of supply chain management and having very low operating costs. Yet... They're also known for blowing through most of their revenue. I don't understand how that's possible. Um, I don't know this. Yeah, I mean, this is like what they're known for. But part of it is uh, I think they have a strong belief in growing and not sitting still. So they could sit still and make a lot more money. But they want to keep hiring engineering talent, investing in warehouses, pushing delivery times down. I was thinking about that the other day. Uh, you know, I have Prime and I had to start paying taxes. And now I eventually because of that like a lot of they took a lot of flack a lot of people left it but now i actually get a lot of packages on one day or on sunday because they've put warehouses in my state california um mm -hmm. because they lost the tax shelter thing or that's not what it's called yeah but, that's right um yep. so like i think they are willing to aggressively pursue things which are expensive um for kind of securing future total income growth even if it means that their profits will be down for a while but they feel like this is how they can't, they don't just become another cheap place to buy stuff, right? It's why they didn't get beat out by eBay or by someone else because you still go to Amazon, they still supply millions of products, deliver them in a day or two. Um, people really yeah, like that. But sense. it's expensive to keep people. People would leave for any reason. So you can't give them even one. Yeah. Amazon also does a bunch of really cool stuff. They had this thing where they... Um, they took sort of like the head of their distribution, like the most commonly sold items. And uh, then they took their population and they tried to estimate like the likelihood, given, you know, a city of you know, a million people, what is the likelihood that one of them will buy 
like one of these popular items. And once that's high enough, they just ship it. So it's, so in other words, like, like HDMI cables, like they're already sitting in the distribution center closest to your house because yeah. the likelihood of one person in California wanting an HDMI cable, like in central California wanting an HDMI cable is so high that uh, they can just always keep a supply there. And then literally they just have to drive it like 10 miles to that person. You can think about the same thing as like uh, Walmart knowing that the first cold blizzard headed to a town, a bunch of people are going to go buy heaters. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, it's same, like that, kind of but uh, but much faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyways, they're AWS. I mean, they've continued to push and be a market leader, and they are the biggest uh, cloud services provider um, by a pretty good margin. And wow, this chart is super interesting. Like they actually, even though they're the biggest, they're only twenty eight percent. The other was crazy. I don't know. Uh, what yeah. J- Jason's looking at a pie chart that's showing yeah. the breakdown of uh, percentage of cloud revenue or cloud businesses. Um, and there's a huge chunk, which is just kind of like everybody else, but it's a big chunk. So I don't know exactly how this is from the New York times, how they're classifying, uh, well, what yeah, constitutes a it, cloud service. Yeah. Assuming they do it in order, then what that means is 43% of the market is consumed by, by companies who have less than 3% each. Yes. Which is, so that means like, yeah, like at least like 12 companies that all are all sharing, you know, two or three percent. But like on um, here, there's no like, like Dropbox isn't on here, right? But like, be given these other names like Salesforce, I would imagine Dropbox is probably on here. Well, I somewhere. think Dropbox runs on Amazon, right? Doesn't it? Oh, does it? Oh, yeah. It's well, like Dropbox. But, but like, if you had something like that, right? Like, if you had Dropbox or Netflix, right? They would be big contributors. They haven't run on Amazon. I think you're right, but uh. yeah, that's super interesting, man. Unbelievable. I had no idea that I, I always thought actually I thought Amazon was much larger. Like I was expecting Amazon to be like fifty percent, and then there not to be much. Uh, yeah, but much look how much others. money that would be. If they I were fifty percent, right? yeah, that would be like over three billion dollars. Yeah, a quarter. Wow, a quarter. So. Wow, unbelievable. And it's very consistent money too. It's not like you know you have to wait for the holiday season or something. Cool. So that was awesome. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so my next article is JQ, which is a command line JSON parser. So, a lot of people, definitely, if you're doing any web stuff, but even if you're not, you're probably using JSON for something. Um, it's like XML, but it's much more terse, and uh, you don't have to get like matching the opening and closing tags, which is always a nightmare. And so. Uh, Definitely, you know, if you want to store some data, JSON's a good way to go. Um, this is a pretty cool command line parser. So think of it as like a sed tool for JSON. So you could say, you know, hey, go in and rip out this one uh, object, you know, search for objects, um, filter out objects, things like that. Um, looks pretty cool. I'm definitely going to give it a shot. I actually just found out about it today. But, uh, you know, they have some, they have some examples here and... Uh, I kind of, I find myself often needing stuff like this to, uh, on like server side, like just to do some analysis. Like we use a lot of MongoDB and in MongoDB, you know, everything is uh, a BSON, but it's really a JSON stored in binary. But from your perspective as a database client, MongoDB is storing, you know, JSON documents. And so if you want to dump it to disk and then take a look at it, this is a pretty cool, pretty cool tool. So. Yeah, check it out. It's called JQ. I may or may not have done something awful. I wrote a command line tool that took a JSON string as a command line argument. No, that's good. That's no, it was bad. crazy. Yeah, I mean, I did it. It was it worked really well, and I thought it was an elegant solution. But when I told yeah. people, like, oh, yeah, this tool, they're like, you know, what parameters does a tool take? I'm like, it takes this, this, and then it takes a JSON string. And they're like, what? <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> Well, uh, so it was like a templating system. So you have like a template file and you're trying to run something on it and the JSON right. string holds what to replace in the template, but you could name it many, many different, like the individual variables, many things. And it was kind of the fastest way to say, I want to provide a whole list of replacements dynamically. And it you don't ever create the string by hand. Like you typically run this tool from another tool. Um, right, right. But yeah, I was kind of like, people looked at me funny when I was like, so yeah, one of the command line arguments is a JSON string. 
So this is the yeah, reverse I mean, of that, the command line tool that parses the JSON string. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that like, if it's, if it's a simple thing where it's just, you know, a list of objects or maybe just, I mean, a list of, of, of numbers or it's just like one object, then like, yeah, I mean, why would you do that parsing yourself when you could just tell well, people? Well, that was like, it. I, I could have places. written like arbitrary command line parsing, like, right? Like name, colon, replacement, name, colon, replacement, like yeah, blah, 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 blah. Why blah, would blah. you do that? But it comes from, uh, already comes from a file that is, anyways, there's a, there's reasons for it, but I felt kind of like there's probably a better solution. I just don't want to wait around. Yeah, I mean, JSON, this is a great idea for that. I mean, anyways. yeah, it, depending on the circumstances, it might be better to read from a file <laughs> that has the JSON Shh, in it. But. There was reasons I couldn't do that. but Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, uh, okay, you got the next right. one. Yep, so this one is a little bit old now, but I thought it was really interesting. So... GitHub came under denial of service a couple weeks ago, um, and it was turned out that specifically a website hosting uh, circumvention for the firewall of China, the Great Firewall of China, whatever it's called, the Chinese firewall that uh, <laughs> prevents people inside of China from getting censored news. Um, it was a, I guess, like a proxy for it, uh, and it was like getting pretty well known. And the Chinese government now, in retrospect, seems like it got mad about it and so they made an attack against um github specifically this page um of course you know china has like many many computers and it actually looked like this one was coming from not a single isolated place but all the computers in china and and further analysis showed that uh baidu which is the search engine uh biggest search engine in china was everybody who ran a search on baidu so you know lots and lots of different computers um they would inject an ad and part of that ad would be to go ping, uh, you know, retrieve data from this website um, uh. that they were trying to take down. And so, and it would do it every two seconds. So as long as you were on the search results page, it would keep hitting the GitHub server uh, and they would do Wait, this what's across. What's the connection between Baidu and, oh, oh Baidu is the Chinese web, web search thing. Right, but what it was is uh. a website hosted behind the firewall and no one knows exactly how they're doing, but I guess sus suspected was that they, when the firewall was serving the page, it was automatically swapping the ad. So Baidu wasn't like necessarily in on it, but the firewall was able to switch the ads dynamically. Oh, interesting. So everyone who was going to Baidu was getting this ad injected replacement, right? Um, that was causing this. And so uh, GitHub's response, which was pretty good, was they, in the string being pulled, they added a JavaScript alert, like, please stop doing this or something. And so if your computer was repeatedly trying to do this, it would get an alert and the JavaScript processing would stop until you cleared the alert, which meant that each person's computer would only do it once until they clicked OK. Uh, and and it, it would annoy away. people. Like People would immediately be like, what, what is this? Yeah, so it is interesting that the Chinese government lashed out at GitHub because you don't think of GitHub as being like, I don't know, politically active. But in Yeah, this they case, probably just didn't know... Uh, uh, what it was like they, they didn't know that github was just open source anything they probably thought it was specific to this thing well maybe the chinese government had asked github to take it down and GitHub was like no and, and then it happened <laughs> i mean be. it could yeah. be any number of things i i don't know the story there but it was just interesting to read about like how the attack went down finding it figuring it out and kind of scary that like the chinese government was attacking a corporate like a company right like not another government. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And then, you know, the U.S. doesn't necessarily respond like, hey, stop attacking GitHub or we're going to attack you. Like, but yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah just, I thought that, it's just weird, I thought right? that you could, uh, like, I guess, so just looking at it mathematically, it seems like you can trivially break through the Chinese firewall just by using some kind of BitTorrent-based internet browser, right? Well, I mean, I think there's lots of ways around it for people who know or want to get around it. But I th the problem is there's still intimidation. If you circumvent this, we will come and find you. But they can't, right? I mean, you could make it like pretty untraceable, right? Yeah, but are, are you going to bet your life on it? <laughs> Actually, you know, the hard part is um, is not not getting the information, um, but then is, is not using it. Like, in other words, if, um. I, if I use like a, some kind of Tor browser to read CNN. Now I know things that nobody else in China knows. 
And so if I start telling my neighbors about this cool CNN article, now all of a sudden, like, that's how you're going to get caught, right? It's like when you're eventually you're going to tell somebody who's like sympathetic to China and they're going to tell the police on you and then you're going to go to jail. Like, that's actually how you'll get caught. Yeah, I've tried to talk to people about it and I always get different uh, responses from people who have spent time in China or lived in China or born in China. Um, but, you know, I think part of the Chinese government is just is not trying to keep a determined individual from not being able to see the information, but to kind of just stop it from entering the zeitgeist of society. You know, Got it's, it. it's not become like the average person just hearing a whisper of a word on the street can't just go look it up and figure it out. Like you'd have to be seeking it out, going, determining that you're going to go find it. I, I was working, uh, once I worked at this company where uh, they blocked like a bunch of pages on the internet. It's um, so like, like Gmail was blocked and things like that. Um, and I There are more than wrote, one such companies, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wrote this this fork of Google Chrome called Google Crime, C-H-R-I-M-E dot E-X-E. And it was just a fork of Chromium that would just basically bounce the data off my computer at home and let me get on Gmail. Um, I found out like a few months ago that there are people at this company still using it. Like, and, and it's not updated. So there's like, there's a bunch of people who are still using like Google Crime circa, you know, seven years ago to get on Gmail. <laughs> but everyone Such has smartphones now. I know, right? That's what I said. But but they're like, no, well, you know, we want Gmail on the desktop, and this is the way to get it. So. Why? I guess it's like you know the like it's stuff so has painless. come so far in mobile now. Like I have my phone, and it gets you know automatic notifications without even using that much data. It pushes them to me. It just pops up a notification. Like I don't need it on my desktop. I think it's like it's just the risk reward, right? Like they feel like. I mean, the Google crime stuff's already done, so there's no risk, and they don't feel like they're gonna get fired or anything. And so it's like, there's just virtually no risk. And so even if the reward is just marginal, like you have Gmail on your desktop and your phone, they just do it anyways. I would say these people <laughs> should find a new job, but if they're just using your tool from seven years ago instead of rewriting it for themselves to get it updated. <laughs> fair, fair point. These people are probably listening. Um, Anyways, <laughs> all right. Time for book Onto of the show. B -b 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 -book, book of the show. So, um, oh, I had something I really wanted to talk about, but uh, anyways, we'll, we can save it for next show. But uh, actually, I'll, we'll talk about it after book of the show. Just a very short interjection. Um, so my Suspense. book of the show is a theory of fun in game design, which is pretty cool. This book was loaned to me from a friend. And uh, basically, it goes over um, like a theory of fun. Like, like if you were making a game, then like, 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 you know, you might ask someone like, "Is this game fun? Like, is Pac-Man fun? Is GTA V fun? You know, why are these things fun?" These are like super hard questions, at least for me, because it's like deeply psychological and things like that. Um, but this tries to formalize it, and I felt like it did a pretty good job. It's pretty interesting. Um, you know, obviously a lot of it comes down to like patterns and the satisfaction that, you know, your brain gets when it, um, encounters different patterns, when it recognizes a pattern and things like that. Um, it also just talks about game design at a high level and it was pretty, it was a pretty good read. It's a very short book. It's almost written like a comic book, so it's not, it's not heavy or anything, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. A theory of fun. I feel like it's like weak or strong. It's not fun. It's funner or uh, more <laughs> fun or less fun. Is Pac-Man funner than uh, GTA? The internet tells me all people do in the new GTA is find crazy ways to die. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's all um, the videos I see about it. One, some are that, oh, wow, look how realistic this is in like in-game photography. That's one thing. And the other thing is like, look at this crazy way this guy died. Yeah, GTA, I feel like, did a huge disservice. I don't know if this is true for the public at large or just me, but you could pre-order GTA V uh, a long time ago, like I think like six months ago, you could pre-order it, and they would give you like three million in fake like GTA V money. Because I guess the way it works is like, even when you're playing single player, you need an internet <coughs> connection, 
And so it keeps you from cheating, even in single player, and you have to use in-game uh, currency to buy things, right? Now, you can't, you can't actually spend money. It's not like a freemium or anything like that. You can't turn real money into in-game money, but the in-game money has to be kind of respected. I'm assuming GTA 6 will have something where you could spend real money. It's like going that path. But the, uh, but so yeah, so they gave you like three million, I think, in fake money. Then, like about two months before it came out, I saw some article about it, and I was like, oh, it's cool. So I went to see if you know maybe I'd pick it up, and they had like said that you get one and a half million in fake money, because basically like you're no longer an early adopter, so they only gave you that in fake money. And I kind of felt screwed, like, hey, just because I didn't pre-order it earlier. You know, you're going to, like, screw me out of 1.5 million of fake money. So I didn't buy it. And then it came <laughs> so out. So now you got zero. And then it, yeah. And then it came out, and a bunch of people were like, oh, this game's great. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll buy it. But now there's nothing. Like, you start with zero. So now I'm like, forget it. I'm going to wait until No, they've got you, because now you're going to buy, you're going to pre-order GTA 6 the first day it's available for pre-order. Oh, that's their long-term strategy. Yes. Maybe. But you for GTA for it. 5, it did not work, because now I just feel like, why would I play when I'm going to be borrow three million it from a behind? I'm going to actually wait till it goes on sale instead of spending uh, the sixty. I feel like that's how like I'll lose three million in virtual. <laughs> yeah, I'll lose three million in virtual currency, but I'll gain twenty dollars in real currency. But you'll still have spent the money, so you'll still have lost. <laughs> yeah, and their margin is huge, so. Who cares? <laughs> yes, uh, and we. This would lead perfectly into talking about the. A uh, new kerfuffle about Steam charging for mods, but uh, we'll save that. My uh, book that's of, right, I saw that. My book of the show is the programming title Monster Hunter International. This is not a book about programming, I lied. Um, okay. It is yet another science it's fiction fantasy lying. novel. Ah, okay. <laughs> this one happens to be, I guess it's considered horror fantasy. It's everything that's got monsters is considered horror, but this is not, <laughs> this is not very dark. Um, it's a very light book, and I was reading it, and it was just like, this is a really fun book. Um, I read The Martian, and I thought The Martian was really fun. Um, yeah. A very lighthearted book, I thought. Like, it was serious, but, you know, like, also, I laughed out loud a lot. Um, this book wasn't quite as funny, um, but it was really good. And, you know, it's just a good, fast-paced, goofy story, almost like you'd see in a movie. Um, and I read a cool. lot of, like, deep, thought-provoking uh, science fiction fantasies. This wasn't like that, per se. Um, but it was a lot of fun to read. And then later I read an uh, article about this guy, and I guess that's what he says he, he's trying to do, is just write lighthearted stuff. Like, why do we all have to be artistic and literary? Why can't we just write good, fun-to-read stories? Um, cool. So That sounds great. What, what's it. the theme? It looks like it's like a vampire Yeah, so it's, it's basically about, like, a guy who's just almost kind of like a superhero. Not He doesn't have, like, superpowers, but he just, like, destroys monsters so like there's monsters in the world you know the government's trying to keep it secret and this guy like hunts them and there's other people that hunt them too and he you know joined forces and something really bad is happening and they're going to work to try to stop it so literally like every tv show you've ever seen um but i i listened to it on audible because like we mentioned last time uh that's how i do most of my listening even though i say reading because i don't have time to read i'm way too busy uh, or I'm lazy yeah. to read. So I listen to most <laughs> of my books uh, and I use Audible and we have Audible as a sponsor now. So if you're interested in getting a month of free Audible, you can That's check right. out audibletrial.com slash programming throwdown. Programming throwdowns, all lowercase, all one word. Really long name. Sorry about that. Um, audibletrial.com slash programming throwdown. You can get a month free. It's pretty awesome. I recommend it. After your month, you get to keep the book. Um, I have many books now. Uh, lots and lots of books because I have a long commute and uh, I enjoy them. There are other ways to, you, you know, your library has, you know, audio books too, but... Um, yeah, yeah, the Overdrive or yeah, whatever, the program but it's, from the It library. doesn't have nearly as many uh, and you have to kind of wait for them to be available, which is kind of annoying and I'm really lazy, so... Yeah, and you can support the authors that way too. Support and the support authors. us. And support us. <laughs> <laughs> and support our bandwidth issues. Okay, is it time for your sideline note, cool. or are we moving on to tool of the show? Um, I totally forgot my sideline note. <laughs> time for tool of the show. Tool of the show. I'll have to make it up to you guys. Oh, man, I totally, totally failed on that. Oh, well, next time I'll have to write it down. Tool of the show. My tool of the show. So, um, actually, so 
this is interesting. So I, I always just used whatever default shell um, you know is provided to me. Like usually, like in Ubuntu, it's Bash. Um, in Solaris, it's like CSH or what have you. Um, but then a coworker showed me Oh My ZSH. So I, this is almost like a two-parter. A coworker showed me Oh My ZSH, which is another great tool um, for Mac or Linux, which uh, basically converts your shell to ZSH, but then also adds a bunch of other really cool things. And so I've been using Oh My ZSH for a couple of weeks now. I really love it. It's amazing. If you're, if you're running Linux or Mac, you should definitely get that. But uh, what to do on Windows, right? So um, I have one computer. The computer that I use to do all my MAME hub development is running Windows. And uh, that, as I said, I'm doing development. So I kind of want to have a shell that doesn't, that isn't terrible. And so this is amazing. It's called Baboon. And it is basically, think of it as oh my ZSH for Windows. So it kind of rolls up SIGWIN and ZSH and oh my ZSH all together into one program. Uh, it's easy to install. Um, and then you just start it up and you have this like pretty awesome, um, um, you know, shell like you would have on a Mac or on a Linux computer um, on your Windows desktop. It's pretty sweet. You've had a lot of good tools, but of ones I didn't know about, this looks pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, this is pretty killer. I mean, the whole point of it is it's for Windows. So if you're not a Windows guy, this is like completely useless. But if you're not a Windows guy, get Oh My ZSH. And Oh My Zish, you will, uh, you will be amazed at your productivity. Um, if you are a Windows guy, use Baboon, and uh, it is pretty epic. I love to try this at home. At work, I tried switching to both ZSH and Fish. Uh, and we should talk about shells sometime. Anyways. Uh, from yeah, away from the default shells. away from the default bash but unfortunately my team has a lot of people who wrote really gnarly awful bash scripts to set environment variables for building our project and so yeah. like I, they won't they're just so specifically bash oriented and i my bash but you can always not do strong bash enough. and then the command no because it sets uh sets local things like it sources the scripts and you need to be able to execute them i couldn't figure out how to make it like Oh, back geez. properly like it's so oh, like God. weird i don't so i would have to run well, two thing, and i've just never gotten around to it or maybe i just don't cool know things, enough to to run one from the other yeah one of the cool things about is about oh my zsh is you have one global history for all your you know terminal tabs um but it's even better than that like the first history is local and then after that it's global so if like you want to like just rerun the last command um. on like two different shells like it'll do that but as soon as you go one more command, it goes into the global history. It's very clever. Um, but I, because of that phenomena, like I'll usually have like one or two tabs that are in bash. And so that's because these are things where like I don't want them to pollute my history. Mm. And so you could do something like that. But yeah, uh, it's not fish, ideal. Fish seems like a mostly pre-configured ZSH. And I like there that when you start typing something, it auto-completes to the right of your cursor, like a browser. Oh, wait, it's called fish, like the animal? Yes. Okay, anyways, F-I-S-H, yes. Fish shell. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't even heard of that shell. Yeah, so like if you start typing like LS and then the start of a name, it'll auto-complete to the right and you can just push right arrow to choose that. Ah, very And I think cool. you can do the same thing in ZSH, but it takes extra configuration. Yeah, oh my, ZSH by default doesn't do this, Like, but you can hit tab. You can even auto-complete like git branches and stuff like that. It's pretty awesome, but it does not uh, Anyways, does yep. not well, do that. <laughs> I sent Jason off on a tangent. Uh, and this is all very <laughs> applicable because I my tool of the show this week is Crouton, and Crouton is a project that allows a Chromebook to install a ch root uh, Linux distribution so that you can and now a newly added feature is you can run uh, an XFCE or an Ubuntu an XFCE version of Ubuntu or straight what is it I guess Unity Ubuntu um, mm -hmm. in a window application window on your Chromebook um, oh cool so like a Chromebook is kind of limited I wanted to be able to like in the evenings you know just like on the couch like on my laptop I normally just use my Chromebook for browsing the web and typing, or I use my iPad most of the time, but I have my Chromebook out and I want to be able to like hone my programming skills on the couch. And uh, 
So I wanted to be able to not just have to SSH into my desktop, but actually like on the go or whatever, be able to use Linux on this Chromebook um, because I don't want to buy another laptop just for this purpose. And this is great. It works awesome. So I, yeah, I use sweet. XFCE and it just opens it up as like a new window. It shares, once you get it configured, it's a little wonky, but shares copy and paste between the Chrome browser and the Chrome OS part and the window that is Crouton, you can paste stuff in. Uh, and get it configured, run things, uh, you know, script, download, whatever, share between the two. Um, and it's really awesome. The only snag I've run across is because my Chromebook I have, and I think most Chromebooks are ARM, and most people's desktops are uh, some 32-bit or 64-bit uh, Pentium right. Intel processor or whatever, x86, x64. Um, mm-hmm. There's some tool, most of the tools, the common tools, like in Ubuntu repositories, are compiled for ARM, but some stuff is missing. Um, oh, the, it's wild that the Chromebooks are ARM. That's a, they're probably the only laptops that are ARM that I, that are. The, I don't know that they are all ARM, but I think many of them are. The cheap ones wow. I have are. Um, and now Windows is starting to push to try to have ARM support as well. Uh, but yeah, so like if you download for source, sometimes it won't compile for ARM if you're using weird stuff. And apparently, there's a way to use QMU to do on the fly. Uh, oh, translation, yeah. but if you're doing anything more than like a simple task, it's just going to take forever. Well, I wonder if, you know, like, because Android runs ARM, so I wonder if you're using a Chromebook to do Android development, if the Android emulator runs way faster, because you actually don't oh. need an emulator, it's now a simulator. No idea. I've not tried it. But check it out, wow. Crouton. I, it made my Chromebook suddenly much more useful than it was before to me. Um, yeah, that's killer. Even though it, it's another one of those, like I was saying before the show, that uh, sometimes Linux frustrates me because it takes too long to just get something working. Uh, and you run across a problem and you spend, you know, like a whole day trying to solve your problem. Uh, but it's because I'm trying to do something really awesome. <laughs> so crouton. Well, now you'll have to go and add ARM support to all the Ubuntu packages. Yes, in all my free time. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, time cool. to discuss Fortran. Fortran. So Fortran uh, is a very early language. Um, you don't want to be writing Fortran now unless you are, you know, working on existing Fortran code base. Like if you want to start a new web server or something, you probably don't want to be using Fortran for your new website. Um, but it has a pretty cool, flavorful history, a long history, very interesting, and uh, it's still in use today. A lot of people use it. In fact, you probably run you know, Fortran executables or code that's part, that's been coded in Fortran, you certainly do, and you don't even know it. So that was a lot of caveats. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Fortran stands for formula translating system. And so <clears throat> it, uh, it was the first sort of optimizing compiler. So this is back, you know, when people were writing assembly language and I don't know, did we ever, I think we explained assembly and machine language, you know, like four years ago. We'll recap real quick. So your machine does machine language, which is, you know, each instruction is just, uh, uh, you know, an integer for the instruction name and then some some operands that are all sort of represented in integer format. Assembly language is a little bit higher than than just straight machine code. Um, Yeah, mnemonics, that's what they call it. So like you get a uh, M-N-E, ah. mnemonic, 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 for each, like, the uh, 16-bit instruction may be, like, C-A, and that's M-O-V, move, because move makes more sense to humans than C-A, representing the move instruction to move one register to another. So it'd be, like, C-A-0-1-0-2, move registers one to register two, and then each of those being uh, 16 bits, then... 8 bits, 8 bits uh, would give you a 32-bit instruction. Um, that's not how they would be divided in real life, but um, that would be an example. That right, in, in assembly language, you would have MOV R1, R2, move register 1 to register 2, for example. But it's just is, a straight is every, mnemonic. Is every assembly instruction one machine instruction? Nearly. the Some assembly languages, like it's a two-pass compiler, and in the first pass, uh, it looks for like labels and stuff and assigns them addresses and then, or, you know, holders. And then so that you can do branch to a label instead of branch with a numerical offset. Oh, I see. Uh, so like there are things which aren't actual instructions. 
but yes. Oh, oh, I see. And then those get kind of removed. Yeah. So pass. think like variable names almost, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah, then, gotcha. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, one instruction is one instruction, except for that, and things like uh, Intel processor stuff, and it's uh, instruction you write in quote unquote assembly language uh, may be many, many, many uh, low level instructions getting executed. But it is still one instruction as issued to the processor. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, like certain like. But there's like of wrappers of processors in Intel processors and AMD processors now. Yeah, yeah, like some Cisc machines could actually like sort a list and things like that in in one instruction. But then under the hood, of course, there's all sorts of stuff going on in hardware. Right. Um, cool. Okay. Is so Fortran is the first optimizing compiler. So it actually. It was the first time where somebody said, let's build sort of a higher level language on top of assembly. And then also let's diagnose what the person's intent was and see if we can make like even better assembly than what they intended while preserving, uh, you know, the, the, the same logic while preserving the same computation. Um, Which makes sense because we think today the opposite, like, oh, if I want to make it better, I'll write it in assembly. <laughs> Like that's the ultimate right. optimization, but there are some optimizations that are just way too tedious. You wouldn't ever code by hand, uh, like loop unrolling, like just writing the same C code a hundred times uh, to unroll a loop. You just won't, you wouldn't do that. Like that's just annoying. Uh, people would tell you just go write a loop, but it may make sense if the compiler understands more about the state of the system to unroll yep. the loop for you. Um, but you would never Hopefully do that. Hopefully, you use like a pound define or something. Sure, a macro or something, right? But <laughs> yeah. like in assembly language, you know, there's not necessarily the same conveniences. So you may not write in that style, uh, and it's a little harder to view the structure of the program with an assembly language interpreter than writing in a higher level language where it can understand the flow a little easier. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, I saw something about how like Java, like in certain very specific cases, Java is way way faster than C because of the way the just in time compiler works, it can like unroll loops. Right, it, it understands it no things. At this moment, your system, all this, the runtime variables are now known. And if you do it over and over again, it's the exact optimal version. Right, yep. Um, so, history of Fortran. Fortran was first designed 1953 by John W. Bacchus. Um, it, uh, he claimed it had 20 times fewer instructions and assembly to do the same task, same, uh, you know, coding task. Sounds like a um, big promise. <laughs> yeah, I know. It sounds like uh, the GPU promises that we're seeing now. So uh, his point, he wrote uh, programs for IBM for computing missile trajectories. And uh, he was saying uh, he was lazy and didn't want to write so much assembly. That's what he's quoted as saying. So he thought it would be more efficient for him to invent Fortran than to have to do all of those, all of that assembly programming. And maybe it was, but either way, he, he definitely could be considered a, a philanthropist of sorts because he wrote Fortran and everyone else could benefit, which is pretty cool. Um, so Fortran sort of harkens to like a very early day of computing, definitely before our time, but uh, you know, our <laughs> parents, are, I I if your parents are kind of techie, uh, then uh, if, if you're old as we are and you have parents who are techie or maybe your grandparents were techie, they uh, can tell you about these crazy stories of using punch cards. And actually with Fortran, um, back in the day, people would, um, they would use a special machine, kind of like a typewriter, but it would, uh, you know, when, when you typed C, it would actually punch a hole or maybe two holes um, into a card and then move the card a little bit. Kind of like a typewriter, but with holes instead of... Uh, imagine like a Braille typewriter or something like that. And so you would, you know, type out all of your instructions. If you, like, mistyped something, you would just have to throw that card away and, and start over. Um, and when you were all done, you would take your stack of cards... That and hopefully were, you don't hopefully drop them and get them order. scrambled on the floor. Yeah, if you drop them, forget it, right? Like, I think they're numbered. It's kind of like, you know, how, like, your, your checkbook has numbers. So, so if you drop it, you can, like, you know do a human quick sort <laughs> and <laughs> fix it, but nobody wants to do that. So uh, um, you would take them over to like the, um, I think it's like, there's a special name for it, like a secretary or something, but there's like the a, reader? There's a cool name for it. No, no like, well you take them to a person who would feed it into the machine uh -huh. and then- The computer. So the basically. 
Is that what the... No, I, I, I was don't thinking know. that, but I would... Anyway, there's a person who would... Who, their whole job was to take these punch cards, like stacks of them, feed them into the machine. The machine would take maybe like half an hour um, and then spit out some some results on, I guess, like a like a kind of like a cash register would on a piece of paper. And then they would, you know, attach that to the to the punch cards and give it back to you. So you so imagine like you would you would submit your program depending on like how much work this this gentleman or lady had. Uh, you'd get your program back you know, hours later, and you'd find like oh I had a you know a, some runtime error or something like that. It's just like unbelievable um, that you could get anything done like that. Um, but people did for years and years. But while you're waiting, you just surf the web on your iPhone. So. <laughs> I wonder if someone wrote like a Fortran. Yeah, there are punch card emulators. I found. I was. I are I there was, really? Yes. Yeah. Are there ones for the web? Let me check out. There were. There were ones so on the web. I just was looking. They look like almost like they're just for aesthetic purposes. I couldn't find any where you actually punch your punch cards and feed them in or anything. Oh. Okay. But there is it's a punch card computer I found the other day, like a printoutable. Like you make punch cards and you like slide it through, and it's an actual like. You physically do the computations by. Anyways, it was very intriguing. It's like I want to teach this to my kids one day because I'm a nerdy. But uh, yeah, this is amazing. So I found a website where you can type anything you want, and it will um, put it on a punch card. But just imagine. I mean, program. the worst is like punch you it. punch all the stuff on the punch card, and then your program has like a prob- a bug in it, right? Like it doesn't compile, and then it's like, oh. Yeah, I mean, like, there's physical ramifications beyond just crackles of energy for your code not compiling. Like, you you have to start retyping things. Like, think of all those I dead wonder, trees like, you wasted. That's not green. <laughs> like, if if you have an error, do you have to type every card from that point on to the end? Or can you, like, splice in? I'm sure you, you can splice I mean? in. Why? I mean, I don't think it enforces the numbering. Yeah, I guess that's true. It's Maybe like, that how do you, that's how you make V2, mind. man. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, yeah, that that's completely mind blowing. As, as a new, as a new, uh, new meaning to technical debt. <laughs> yeah, that's true. the literal that's weight like- of the cards for your system. <laughs> uh, so uh, obviously, you know, nobody had a computer in you know, 1950, just hanging out. There were there was a handful of uh, well, there's more than a handful of computers, but there was you know, one computer for maybe you know 10 or 20 people, and so at least, and so. Um, these were called mainframes, and uh, and so uh, you know that one person who's just feeding all the punch cards through is interacting with the computer. Everyone else is just you know interacting with the punch cards. Um, Fortran still gets used today, but not punch cards, as far as I know. Uh, hopefully, uh, but yeah, Fortran still lives on in many places where you do numerical processing. So you may have come across it before or heard about it. It still backs some of the most well-known. Uh, Linear algebra systems like LA Pack, uh, lots of MATLAB, I believe, modules are still in Fortran and optimized yep. that way. Um, and it's just really useful for uh, people doing scientific computing where this is like where it kind of got its start. Uh, and so like in high performance computing and stuff, Fortran is used often and uh, it just carries over that, that really high performance people uh, wanted to use it. And so the high performance process, uh, high performance modules uh, still often have Fortran in them. That's right. Like if you do anything on your computer with images, like any kind of image manipulation at all, even if you just like turn a PNG into a JPEG, you're using Fortran code. Like uh, it's it's absolutely everywhere. Um, it's on every machine, so it's it's completely ubiquitous. Um, but you know, granted, most people probably don't even know what that code is doing. I mean, they they know the intent of the code, but they couldn't. They couldn't, uh, you know, fix bugs. Well, it's like anything. The so, more optimized it becomes, the harder to read it typically becomes. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. The more definitely. obtuse the optimizations chosen are. Yeah, right. So, um, so there's a few modern compilers for Fortran. Uh, Fortran, just like C++, you know, it had uh, C++ has, has the original version which was uh, written in, uh, the compiler was written in C. Actually, sorry, the compiler... It was written in C, and it also generated C code, so it didn't go straight from C++ to, to the machine. Then there's multiple iterations on that. There were kind of tweaks to the language over the years. 
and then now we have the C++11, right? So same with Fortran. There was, there was an original version of Fortran. There's a very popular one called Fortran. Wait, I think we have C++14 now. What? Yeah, C++14 is a thing. And I think really? they already have C++17 is in the works now. You're, you're behind, man. What? I am so far behind. I'll have to look into that and find out what they added in 14. Wow. That's like a return um, type deduction, relaxed const expressions, variable templates, aggregate member initialization, digit separators, generic lambdas. These are all C++14 features. Oh, generic lambdas, really? Like function pointer kind of thing? Well, in C++11, the lambda function parameters had to be declared with concrete types. But in 14, that requirement got relaxed. Oh, okay. Good this is Patrick reading excerpts from Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so compile. So now you know, I'm assuming G95 is implementing the Fortran 95, which is, which is that version of Fortran. Um, there's also GNU or new G Fortran. Um, that's the one I've used to build uh, SciPy. Yeah, that's part of the GCC um, collection. That's right. So if you have GCC, which your most, most machines do, you also have G Fortran. And so if you have to build SciPy from source or if you want to, um, you'll, have to you'll have to have that installed. And you'll, well, I you'll think see I did that once. And yeah, and then I was like, wow, that's like a long time. Yeah, it takes forever. So the interesting thing, it'll actually... Um, like recompile the same program many times to find the best way to compile it. It's kind of like mind blowing. Um, so yeah, so those are the compilers uh, in a nutshell. So what are some pros of Fortran? Punch cards. Punch cards. I mean, come on. Like what, what language is freaking punch cards? Only people Amazing. who have never had to program in punch cards before would be so excited as punch cards as Jason and I. <laughs> yeah, I just like uh, man. I mean, talk. About, I wonder if uh, we could we could get our hands on some punch cards. Someone told me that some used. of the computer museums have them, but they think that they may not let you run your own programs anymore. Oh, oh, I see. They'll have the like place where you There's can. Gotta, run. Yeah, yeah. I, I really want to one day just to say I could, but I don't know if you could. Like that seems like something that has like moving parts that you couldn't just buy an old one on eBay and expect it to work. So like. I feel yeah, like we'd have to find an emulator. Refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But if you have an emulator, it kind of defeats the point. Like, it'd be pretty sweet if we could... You should make uh, one with an Arduino. Oh, punch card. If we could take, like, a transpiler, like, go... like use, If there's a G4 tran that goes to LLVM, then you could take, like, a very complicated... Like, you could take some neural network, compile it to LLVM, then transpile it to Fortran, and then run it on one of those old machines. And uh, I want to compile cool. my JavaScript Node.js uh, program <laughs> <laughs> to so, assembly like on server, punch cards. The server is like, please wait while we read these punch cards. <laughs> please wait while we read these 17 million punch cards. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm going to make that at work. I'm going to measure my productivity and number of punch cards it would have taken to do my work. <laughs> so like instead of like system lines of code or whatever like i generated 100 slot to, it's like i generated 10 billion punch cards today <laughs> <laughs> that'd be amazing yeah using the trans it's like your three million you gta it. dollars yeah that's right that's right i generated three million punch cards worth of code that's today. a new byline of our show increasing your punch card output by immeasurable percentages <laughs> I totally think the the next logo or a logo of programming throwdown has to be this punch card that I'm looking at right now, that has that has programming, says programming throwdown, throwdown punched into punch it. card. Yeah, that looks awesome. That's like one of those like binary clocks where you get it like for the novelty, and then you spend a year trying to trying to read it. Okay. And all right. So another pro about Fortran is pretty cool. It's pretty unique. Um, so Fortran actually started some of the trends of doing kind of crazy things to optimize the code. And Fortran kind of started that whole movement. Um, Fortran had a directive called frequency. So have you, you've probably used this, Patrick. Have you used the register directive in C? All the time. Seriously? Yeah, seriously, I would have used oh, really? it a lot. Yeah. 
It just actually it registers. Like, there's a better way to do it. Uh, but yes, I know what you're talking about. Register, because that's optional. But there's a way to force yeah, it to be alias to say, an register actual register. Do anything. Ah, well, it's supposed to be a hint, but I don't know that yeah, it actually but, works. Um, but there's a way to actually force the... the compiler to use to save a register and then use that register for the variable you're using. Ah, uh, okay. It's um, like some kind of a, like language maybe, specific. Maybe it's GCC specific, I don't know. But there's like a yeah, more yeah. forceful way to do the same thing. Yeah, that makes it like some kind of like underscore, underscore, blah, 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 or something. It's probably that and it's GCC. Um, maybe. I don't yeah. remember the syntax. Well, the, the, uh, um, so the register thing in C is not used anymore. Like modern compilers, I don't think respect it anymore because they've found like statistically they took like the top 100 programs that had register and they found that if you took away a register it actually performed better nice. because the compiler is just so much smarter than we are so uh register became a no-op like i don't know a few years back and frequency is also a no-op in fortran but it used to actually tell fortran to do some monte carlo simulation um, which we talked about on earlier episodes when we talked about like you know rejection sampling and things like that um, but yeah, the Fortran compiler would do a Monte Carlo simulation to figure out how to lay the blocks of codes and lo- blocks of code in a way that uh, is most efficient. Oh. Um, and it, and it makes sense because this guy was at IBM uh, working on missile, uh, you know, guidance simulation, which is full of Monte Carlo sampling. So he's probably an expert on that, and so he put it into his compiler, which is mm-hmm. pretty sweet. I should clarify too, my use of register was because I was about to write inline assembly um, for accessing special registers on the processor. So it wasn't for speed. Oh, interesting. Okay. <clears throat> I remember uh, Off topic. doing FPGA work where uh, you know, like you'd write to a certain block of memory. Like you would just do like X equals three and, and it'd just be hanging out there and you'd never use X. And I, I remember looking at that code and thinking like, I'm not a, you know, I'm like a more theoretical comp sci guy. So I, I just saw this X equals three hanging out. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, why do you do this? And someone told me like, oh, that that variable X is pointing to like some special memory. And there's this other processor like FPJ that's listening to that memory. Yeah. And so when you do X equals three, like it immediately goes into this other processor. And uh, um this so is just like once you get into low level stuff, there's a bunch of these kind of yeah. Like so I've done code like that. Tricks. You have to mark it volatile, memory map it. You can use a linker if you want, or there's other ways mm-hmm. to basically place it at a specific address. And then when you access those addresses, the bits come out on a special bus, and the FPGA listens to that bus and responds appropriately, either storing the data or writing it back to you when you try to read it. And it's a kind of a way to communicate. Um, that's different than like I squared C or SPI or something because the data rates can be much higher because it's meant for as if it was just memory mapped RAM, but it's really a, a processor. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it, the, the data rate can be as high as like the trace, right? Or as, as high as the other processor is running or something like that. It can be really fast. Be really fast. Yeah. It's configurable, right. yeah. I mean, it depends <laughs> on the processor. How do you ensure that the other person has read it? I mean, they just have to provide a guarantee that they meet the timing spec. Oh, I see. So it gets clocked cool. out, and they have to guarantee, like in the FPGA design, that it doesn't work like a processor, right? It's simultaneous. So, like, the logic it flows into is capable of uh, consuming the byte or bytes you transfer before they go away. Got it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Like, it's propagation speed, not... Uh, like processor speed. Yeah, so you basically, it needs to read that information um, and pass it on to the next stage in the pipeline before you get write it again. Yep. Something like that. Yep. Um, cool. So what are the cons of Fortran? Um, yeah, basically, don't use Fortran. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, MATLAB, R... SciPy are just way better. You know, the tooling is way better. Um, uh, the, the support for, you know, reading images, all these things, just so much superior in these other languages. So, I mean, Fortran is cool. As I said, you know, all of us are running Fortran code, um, unbeknownst to most of us. 
Um, and so for that reason, it's very cool. And you might even have to debug some Fortran code, especially if you're doing some image processing or you know, something like that. Um, but really at this point, it's just kind of like a cool history lesson. Um, you should not try and build your next website in Fortran. What? <laughs> the ringing so, endorsement uh, of Jason. Yeah, yeah. Jason, Jason does not uh, does not support this message. I do not approve this <laughs> message. That's right. Yeah, I do not approve this message. Um, but it's cool. Check it out. It's uh, it's an interesting one to know. Um, as I said, you know, you could shock your friends by telling them that their computer is running Fortran code and they don't even know it. Um, because all your friends want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You'll become that guy. <laughs> you are already that guy. Yeah, we're we're that we were that guy. We've been that I guy. I am that guy. <laughs> you, you per, <laughs> All right. So next time, I think that's I think that's it for me. All right, guys, have a good one. The intro music is Axo by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.